Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first event of the CelloCamp talk series. I'm Rachel Jacob, program manager at CelloCamp, and here with me on screen is our special guest speaker, Sepp Kamvar, co-founder of Cello, who you will hear from shortly. Hi, Sepp. Hi, how are you, Rachel? Welcome. Uh, but before we get started with today's talk, I'd like to briefly speak about CelloCamp and what's ahead. We are currently two weeks away from the application deadline, which is October 5th, and I highly encourage you to visit CelloCamp.com and apply today. Um, CelloCamp is a really motivating, inspiring, and growth experience for anyone involved. It's a two-month virtual acceleration and mentorship program for the Cello ecosystem. It's a startup competition that supports decentralized technology entrepreneurs and developers and helps them build sustainable businesses. Um, we see the camp as an entry point for founders to manifest their vision on Cello and help bring their ideas to fruition and success. Some of the benefits of joining Cello Camp Wave 2 are winning prizes amounting to 30,000 CUSD, receiving a fast track to Cello grants, and also high exposure to investment opportunities. One of the most significant aspects of the program is our mentorship program, where we have an amazing lineup for Wave 2 uh, mentors from organizations like Anderson Horowitz, Polychain, Winklevoss Capital, Gitcoin, Blockchain, Blockchain Founders Fund, Roka Capital, and many more. And uh, we're really excited to have them on board with us to mentor and guide our teams. Also, through our eight-week curriculum, teams will learn how to build sustainable businesses by receiving guidance and advice on how to build your projects, bring them to market, and scale. You'll also have the opportunity to increase your network be part of a supportive and vibrant community of like-minded entrepreneurs and developers who are building on the Cello platform. So we hope you join us for Cello Camp Wave 2. Visit our website at cellocamp.com for more information and apply before October 5th. So now for our main event today, we'll be hearing from Sepp, who will be speaking on Cello values to understand the ethos of Cello, how it's uniquely positioned, and why entrepreneurs should build on Cello. Sepp is uh, the co-founder of Cello. He's also a computer scientist, an artist, and an entrepreneur. He also co-founded Mosaic and Wildflower Schools. Before Cello, he was a professor and the head of the Social Computing Research Group at the MIT Media Lab. And while pursuing his PhD at Stanford, Sepp co-founded Caltex, which was acquired by Google. He's also the author of three books and more than 40 technical publications and patents. He received his PhD in scientific computing and computational mathematics from Stanford University and an AB in chemistry from Princeton. Sepp, we are really excited to hear you speak to us today. And to our audience, thank you for joining us. We will have time for a Q&A with Sepp after the talk. So feel free to start asking questions in the Q&A tab down below. Uh, thank you, Sepp, for joining us today. And I will pass the floor on to you. Thanks, Rachel. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, can I, can, is there a way that I can see the, the slides rather yeah. than, than my face? Ah, much better. Uh, uh, so I'm going to give a variant of a talk I gave uh, at the Blockchain for Social Impact conference uh, a couple months back. And, um, and I want to start by, by talking a little bit about a lesson I learned when I was at Google. I, I was at Google from 2003 to 2007. Um, and during that time, uh, the, the company grew quite a bit. Uh, there were about 800 people at Google when I joined. And when I left, there were about four years later, there were about 25,000 people. Um, and as a consequence, I mean, all of the groups were growing quite fast, including my group. And, and, and I had to learn how to lead a growing group. Um, and in that time, one of the things that I learned was one of the best, the best things that one can do in the service of a vision is to tell a story, to tell a story that is, uh, um, that is beautiful, um, that is uh, both beautiful and achievable. Uh, because if you can tell a story that's both beautiful and achievable, it will resonate with the people with whom it's meant to resonate with. And people will naturally find um, places in the story that fit. 
um, and extend the story to create a story architecture. Um, and uh, and these stories, uh, they're not, uh, I mean, I think a lot of modern society thinks about stories as, as created um, by, by an author. Um, but here, I mean, I think uh, the story that I'd like to tell is a story that exists, that has existed for a while. Um, and it's a story whose time has come. Um, and so I wanna start off this story by talking about painting. Um, and let's go to the next slide. Thanks, Rachel. So uh, in the mid 1800s, there were two technical innovations around painting. Uh, the first was a paint, the paint tube, which was invented in 1841. Um, and this is, this image is from the original patent for the paint tube. Uh, and this was a big advance from the previous technology for holding paint, which was, uh, can we go to the next slide? which was a pig bladder. Um, and as you can imagine, the paint tube made it easier to go outside and paint. It's a lot harder to carry around a bunch of pig bladders um, and go paint a landscape far away. And the second innovation was the metal ferrule. Uh, the ferrule is the part of the brush that connects the part, uh, the, the brush to the handle. And before the metal ferrule, people generally used wire or string ferrules. But when you use wire or string, the only paintbrush that you can make is a round tipped paintbrush. And the metal ferrule allowed people to make flat paintbrush brushes, which in turn made it easier to create the impasto effect, an effect where you can paint thickly on the brush and put paint thickly on the brush and then brush in short, quick strokes. Um, and the combination of these two inventions resulted in a style of painting that we now know as impressionism. Um, and I think this is, amazing and this is the story of the world um it's uh it's uh here what happened was that there were a couple of technical uh, technological advances in an expressive medium and those technological advances increased the expressive range of that medium and that increase exp in the expressive range allowed for people to create beauty in a way that they could not they could not do before now this talk uh, is about money, it's not about painting. Um, and so, but I think this story is important because it's, because money is also is an ex expressive medium. It can only express one thing, which is value. Um, and, um, oh, uh, let's, let's go back a slide. Um, uh, it only expresses one thing, which is value, but it expresses value reasonably well. And so it's useful to ask, what are the five features of money that can create, what are the features of money that can create a more beautiful world? And I'd like to suggest five. Um, all, of, all of these fives are, are old ideas, um, but they're given new vibrancy with the technology that we have today, the technologies that we have today. Um, and so the first feature I'd say is a, is a universal basic income or a universal basic dividend that's tied directly to the money system. Um, a basic dividend is an idea that we see a lot in nature. Um, let's go to the next slide. It's like sunlight, um, or the next slide, or the rain. It's a source of energy that's consistent and distributed evenly within a region. And we see those regions that have healthy universal basic dividends, uh, healthy sunlight and healthy rainfall, are both biodiverse and bioprosperous. So next, let's go to the next slide. The second feature is demerage. And this is an idea by the economist Silvio Gazelle, who was active in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And he observed that basically in times of recession, people tend to hoard money and that the hoarding of money intensifies the recession. Uh, and to counteract this, he suggested a small charge on the holding of money. Um, and the way he proposed doing this was to have a dollar bill but for the dollar bill to be valid, you need to fix a stamp on it once per month. And that stamp costs one cent. This, as you can imagine, makes people want to spend money rather than hoard it. And there were experiments of this during the Great Depression, most notably in Vorgel, Austria, next slide, um, who issued a demerge charged local currency that you can see here. And it resulted in an oasis of prosperity in the midst of the Great Depression. People called it the miracle of Vorgel. So if we see the universal basic dividend is rain, we can see demerge is evaporation, ensuring circulation, avoiding stagnation, 
and completing the water cycle. Next slide. Uh, the third feature is, is, is called natural capital backed currencies. And this is an idea by a philosopher who I love named Charles Eisenstein. And he observed that whatever backs money, people tend to make more of uh, because it's like printing money. Um, so when gold backed money, there was intense incentive to mine gold. Um, so Charles suggested, well, why don't we back money with things that we like? Next slide. Um, uh, oh, and the slide after that. Um, like, like that one, yeah. <laughs> like pristine forests or clean rivers. Um, I think that's a beautiful idea. And, um, and that's the third feature called natural capital back currencies. The fourth feature, for lack of a better word, is called an ecology of value. And I think the best way to describe this is to make an analogy to the internet. When the internet first came out, a lot of people looked at it and said, wow, like this is amazing. You could imagine putting the whole encyclopedia on the internet. Um, and yes, that's possible. And, and yes, it's powerful. But it underestimated the true power of the internet, which is that it would enable an ecology of information, which includes the encyclopedia, but also that fills niches that it doesn't make sense for the Encyclopedia Britannica to fill. I can now, for example, easily find new physics papers before they're published or learn how to make a treehouse or learn a niche programming language. So too, I imagine the same with money. I can see local currencies and regional currencies, natural, uh, national fiat currencies, global reference currencies, utility currencies, store value currencies, functional currencies, all living side by side with one another each filling ecological niches that are difficult for the others to fill and all of it in all of them interoperating seamlessly. Um, let's go to the next slide. So in the way our current monet uh, monetary environment is like a monoculture, I can see the monetary environment, this monetary environment, that's more like a permaculture food forest with all of the resilience that it implies. Next slide. So the fifth feature is the creation of money in a way that's not concomitant with the creation of new debt. Right now, all money is loaned into existence, which means that there's always more debt than there is money. And I'd argue that at the beginning of the industrial age, that was a feature, not a bug, because it's really impelled growth and growth has been good for us. But now that we're starting to reach the carrying capacity of the earth, it's not clear that we should tie the medium of exchange to the incentive for growth. And besides, there's lots of other ways to bring money into existence. One can imagine gifting it into existence or people earning it to existence for doing meaningful work or having a universal basic income and universal basic incoming it into existence. Um, so I've outlined five features, uh, a basic income, demurrage, natural capital backed currencies, an ecology of value, and the creation of money without the creation of new debt. And all five of these features derive from a more basic set of two values. Uh, and I describe these two values, next slide, um, as unique purpose and connectedness. Uh, to be more specific, the values that we have at Cello is that each person has a unique purpose and that we're all connected. And this seems obvious when I state it this way. They feel like facts, not values, except for the fact that so much of our society is organized as if the opposite were true. If you take a look at our modern suburbs, for example, next slide, uh, houses in a development look like one another, so it doesn't honor a unique purpose. But at the same time, you don't see the courtyards and common greens uh, of, of old villages, so it doesn't honor our connectedness. Or, next slide, if you take a look at modern schools, um, people learn the same thing at the same time, so it does Heaven forbid you talk to your friends in the middle of class, so it doesn't honor your connectedness. And so these features all derive from the question of how to make a financial system that is more supportive of people's unique purpose and people's inherent connectedness to one another. And I think 
all of this can sound abstract. And so I wanna kind of talk a little bit about uh, a story of, 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 a, of a money that has existed. It's a, it's a story of a city in Brazil called Curitiba. Um, and in the early 90s, Curitiba had a garbage problem. Uh, the favelas in Curitiba had roads that were too narrow for the garbage trucks. So garbage would collect in the favelas and overflow into the river. Curitiba also happened to have a bus system that was underutilized. And at the time, they had a very thoughtful mayor, a very forward-looking mayor. And the, the mayor um, decided, to, uh, decided to give people bus tokens in exchange for garbage. Let's go to the next slide. Um, those bus tokens encourage people to start cleaning up garbage and bringing it in, and then people would use the bus tokens that they got to take the bus town to downtown to work. Um, at a certain point, tokens started circulating it as currency in the favelas, um, and, and that was interesting because that made people able to ex uh, collect more garbage than they had a need to take a bus. And so what was this? This was um, a stable coin backed by public transportation, earned into existence through environmental remediation, and simple, sitting happily along the Brazilian hair. Um, next slide. The river got clean. It gave uh, purpose and, and, and work to people, and people were, were rewarded for making their neighborhoods a better place. I can see the world using many more of these. Um, in fact, I, it's, it's the kind of story that existed um, in advance of the internet. One, one thing that I remember is prior to the internet and prior to blogs, there were um, DIY magazines called zines and people would write stories or, or personal opinion pieces or news, local news item, print them out and distribute them amongst, uh, amongst their community. Um, and those zines kind of gave a little foreshadowing of what was possible if you had a technology that made that easier. Because I think one thing that's, uh, one thing that's obvious is that if you make something easier, more people will do it. But what's not obvious is that if you make things, that that relationship is nonlinear. If you make things just a little bit easier, many more people will do it. Um, I remember at Google, we would make a link just a little more visible and millions more people would click on that link. You know? And so if we have the technologies um, to make things like Kurichiba easier, we could imagine a world where many, many more people do this kind of thing. So let's move to the next slide. Um, and so basically kind of that story architecture, what we want to do is we wanna support that story architecture with a software architecture. Um, let's go to the next slide. And you know, when we talk about a lot of these things, some of the technolo technological building blocks have already existed. For example, uh, Block rewards are a way to create money without creating new debt. Next slide. Tokens, ERC-20 tokens, for example, is a way to create an ecology of value. Smart contracts and allow for demurrage. Next slide. But there are some things that are, are, are still nascent um, and were a lot of our motivation for creating Celo. Um, to do a lot of these things right, we needed a notion of stability, a notion of identity, like client support. Um, and so, so we started building these things native into the, into the protocol. Uh, let's move to the next, the next slide. And so I wanna talk a little bit about what natural capital backed currencies looks like in the context of of Cello. Uh, next slide. So right now in the Cello stability protocol, basically each time a, uh, a new Cello dollar comes into existence, 
is purchased into existence with uh, uh, with Bitcoin, uh, with with a purchase of other stablecoin like Bitcoin or Ethereum, which then gets uh, then gets diversified in the reserve. Um, one can imagine that um, over time people will start. Uh, tokenizing real assets. People are already starting tokenizing real assets. And over time, people will start tokenizing forests. And once people start tokenizing forests, one could imagine putting forest token in the reserve, doing something like saying, hey, about 10% of the reserve should be forest tokens. Um, and then what happens is as cello dollars increases in circulation as more cello dollars move into circulation that leads to a growth in the reserve which leads to a growth in the reserve dedicated to forest um, and so basically what it does is it creates a algorithmic demand for forest it creates an algorithmic demand for natural capital um, and so that, and, and, and in order to, so that's the first step and that's lovely. The, the, what we wanna do next though, is we wanna say over time, how do we know that a forest token does represent forest? Um, uh, it's difficult to do through a cryptographic proof. Um, there's a lot of real world, world things that are difficult to do through cryptographic proof. So in this case, what we want to do is what one thing that we could do is we could do it through attestations. So we could say, you know, um, this person attests that, or this organization attests that this token does represent uh, an acre of forest. Um, but but we'd want those attestations to be trusted attestations, and so that requires a system of identity and reputation. And so those two things, the, the stable coin and the stability and the attestation and re, uh, the, the stable coin and the attestation identity and reputation allow for an infrastructure in which we can have natural capital performances. Um, all right, so, so let's, so, so basically I've kind of given a glimpse of a, of a story architecture and a software architecture. And I, now I wanna to move to the, the last piece, which is the social architecture. Uh, Cello ultimately is a community. Um, it is a community of, 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 of developers, of designers, of doers who work together to, to extend the story architecture and to uh, to extend the social architecture, I apologize. We have we have people working at the house right now. Um, to extend the so uh, to extend the story architecture and to extend the software architecture to build a vibrant ecosystem of applications and use cases, and that requires a social architecture, um, and that social architecture basically kind of one of the things that I've felt is that a living, uh, a, a living community is kickstarted through processes. And so I want to kind of talk about three processes today. The first process is, um, is establishing tenants. Let's move to the next slide. Um, so basically what we, what we started by doing is establishing four tenants that are basically our, our values kind of reduced to practice into actions that people can do. Um, and, and we've published them. Basically, in a lot of ways, what it does is those tenants will resonate with some people, will not resonate with others. And those that re it resonates well, with will become attracted to the cello community. Um, let's move to the second. The second is we've established a couple, a couple of practices in the community, a number of practices, but I'll, I'll describe two of them. The first, is this idea that I borrowed from the philosopher Ken Wilber, who, um, who talks about, uh, you know, you can see the world in, in, on four axes. You can, uh, on, the, on the Y axis, you can split it between individual and collective. Now let's move to the next slide. 
And on the x-axis, you can move, you can do it between inside and outside. Um, and so, uh, um, so in the context of a company, for example, the outside individual are things that one can see about a person. Next slide. So those would be skills. The outside collective are things that you could see at, on the company as a whole. Um, so let's take, let's move to the next slide. So that would be systems. On the inside collective, that would be things that are properties of the collective, but that you can't see. Um, and that is culture. And finally, on the inside individual, you have, uh, it's the things about an individual that you can't see, which is spirit. Um, <laughs> so well, let's move to the next slide. And our aim is to continuously grow in all of these, um, uh, in all of these quadrants. Um, outside individual, inside individual, outside collective, and inside collective. Next slide. And there's a question about how do we grow? Um, and I'd like one, one thing that we tend to use, one process that we tend to use is a very simple process um, that was identified by Christopher Alexander um, called, and called the unfolded process. And Christopher Alexander is an architect. And he said, you know, I, to design a house, don't design it on paper and then build the house. Instead, go to the site and ask two questions from the site. The first question is, what is the most, uh, what is the strongest part of the site? And what's the most straightforward way to make it stronger, to strengthen that strength? And then the second question is, what is the weakest part of the site? And what's the most straightforward way to strengthen, to address that weakness? And just do those things and then repeat that process. Look at the revised site, um, ask what's the strongest part of the site and what's the most straightforward thing I can do to make it stronger? And what's the weakest part of the site and what's the most straightforward thing I can do to address it? And if you continue to do that over time, uh, the, the house will unfold rather than being designed. And so that's a process that we could do in each of these four quadrants is we can unfold in the inside individual, we can unfold in the outside individuals, we can fold in our skills, our systems, our culture and our spirit and slowly strengthen over time. And so what I hope to do was just to give a, a high level sense in this talk of the three, three pillars, the, the story architecture, the software architecture, and the social architecture of Cello. And I'm really excited, particularly in this context of building great things together. Thanks all, and I'll open it up to questions. Right, thank you, Seth, for that really inspiring talk. Um, and by so, the way, apologies, we, we're doing some work on the windows, and so, so we had some workers in the background. I apologize about the interruptions there. No worries, I just had somebody mowing the lawn. I was hoping that you would be done <laughs> after, but he left. Um, okay, so we have a couple of questions. Um, Okay, the first one is from Marco. Which UBI experiments have been have you been following and find interesting? Yeah, um, you know, the, uh, one of the most interesting to me historically has been um, one that was uh, a study that was almost an accidental study there was a 10-year a longitudinal study in rural North Carolina around um, mental health outcomes. Um, and um, there was one point where 
there was a, a big rise in mental health outcomes and uh, and uh, basically what people were were trying to figure out what happened there and they looked and what happened was that um, and I'm forgetting the I'm forgetting the tribe but there was a Native American tribe that had established a casino and had shared the profits of the casino equally with everybody. So they basically it ended up being a universal basic dividend to everybody in the tribe. And that universal basic dividend ended up making mental health outcomes sky amongst children skyrocket. It was just an amazing example of the, the power of a universal basic dividend. Um, so I think that on the, on the non-crypto side, that was one of, I mean, there's been several, I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, there's been several of these, but that was the one that has been most interesting to me. Um, I think the second, um, I think in, on the crypto side, I'm super interested in the Good Dollar Project. I mean, I think it's a really interesting, it's, it's one of the most compelling ideas around how to, um, how to bring a basic income through crypto. Great. So our next question is, what would you say is the main advantage of Solo over Ethereum, DeFi, mo mobile, other? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the way that I think about this is, uh, um, it's, it's, not, it's not a zero sum game. Um, and so it's not kind of a competition necessarily between Celo, it's not a competition between Celo and Ethereum or Celo and other blockchains. Each blockchain has their, their role to play and each blockchain will attract different kinds of applications. Um, I think some of the things that we focused on with Celo is to is basically um, one is to have it be mobile first. We we really focused a lot on on the ease of the end user. So uh, so so a lot of the features that we focused on, like client support, proof of stake, um, and proof of stake consensus mechanisms, and so on. Uh, all of these. Uh, an identity layer, all of these were aimed to make it easy for regular people to, um, non-technical people to use uh, applications built on Celo. And, um, and so that has been our focus. Um, I think there's, I, I mean, I think there's lots of, so, I mean, my general feeling is that if I'm building an application, an end user application, I'd be interested in building it on Celo because of those reasons. Um, uh, that being said, like I think there's a lot of applications for which Ethereum is good for. Ethereum has a broad community. They have a lot of applications that are already built on it and so on. And so I see a, a strong relationship between the two projects. Our next question is, uh, can you, oh, I just got them to the top. Can you give an example for how Celo is going to impact developing countries? Yeah. Um, you know, like any, um, any, um, uh, any infrastructure piece, the impact will come from the types of applications that people build on on the blockchain, um, on the seller blockchain. Um, and here, I mean, some of the things that I'd be really excited to see are, um, are uh, starting with basic financial services for the unbanked. Um, right now, about one in three adults are unbanked or underbanked. And as a consequence to that, um, they don't have the ability to send or receive money across a distance easily. They don't have the ability to build a credit score. Um, they don't have to, the ability to collateralize a loan. Um, and all of these things are, are, are big financial primitives. Um, you know, uh, Olaf Carlson Wee, who's, uh, who started Polychain and he's an investor in, or he's a backer of, of the seller of Cello. He, um, he had mentioned once, he said, you know, 
I was lucky enough to grow up in a house. And the reason why I was lucky to grow up in a house is because my parents could have, could get a mortgage. And so by offering, offering, uh, offering financial services to those who don't have financial services right now, I think it will make a big step towards prosperity uh, around people who are unbanked or underbanked. Um, and so I'm very interested in seeing application developers develop basic financial services on top of Celo for those who are unbanked and underbanked. Thank you for that answer. Um, our next one up is, can you give an example of a project that aligns with Celo values and, and you would like to see built on Celo? Um, sure, I, I mean, there's a lot of them. Uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll give a, I'll give a couple. Um, one is, um, I mean, there's a, there's a large number of community currency projects that I'm excited about. One, one example is Seedbed. Um, and Seedbed is a for people to create community currencies. And as I had talked about that, um, uh, the, uh, like over over time, what I see is I see an ecology of value, an ecology of money, where there are local currencies and regional currencies and uh, national fiat currencies um, and global reference currencies, all of which are interoperating with one another. Um, so I'm really interested in in the community currency space. Uh, so that's one. Um, another is a company called Mochafi, which um, which basically uh, that's a company based in the United States, and that gives um, that aims to provide financial services for those who are underbanked in the United States. Um, one of the things that uh, one of the things one of their insights, for example, is that you know um, a lot of people who who don't have a well a, a lot of people pay their rent monthly on time all the time but that monthly rent payment is not incorporated into their credit score and so they're not able to get good credit and so one of the one of the thoughts that um, Wole had was to have a community uh, to have the rental payments be incorporated into one's credit score so Mochafi is another example of a company that I think is doing great work and would love to see them uh, uh, do more with the Cello protocol. Next question is, does Cello offer any decentralized identity solutions? Um, so right now, what, what the Cello protocol has is it has the ability to have a a phone number um, associated with one's public key and verified as one's public key. So the phone number becomes a lightweight identity solution. And um, the uh, um, and over time, that's lightweight. That's not strong enough to be a, a full identity, but it will be useful for a lot of purposes. But then what, what one can imagine is that once you have that phone number, you could start, people could start adding other attributes to that phone number themselves by claiming them. So I can say, my name is Sep. Um, now, if it's just me, I can make that up and I could say, well, my name is John. And so it's useful to have other people attest um, that my name is Sep. Um, but the problem with just that piece is that I could then create a lot of um, identities that um, that point to me and say, well, my name is John. And so what we really want to do is we want to have reputation weighted attestations. And one way we can do that is through a protocol uh, that I worked on uh, a long time ago now in 2003 uh, called Eigentrust, where it basically has, it basically kind of gives uh, it gives a reputational weight 
based on those attestations, but not just based on those attestations, based on the reputation weights of those attestations. And those reputations are in turn uh, given by, uh, weighted by the reputation weights of those attestations. So you end up having a, um, you end up having a, a recursive computation, uh, a recursive identity and reputation computation. Um, so that's, that's one example of something that I'd like to see. So our next question is, love the quote, whatever backed money people tend to make more of it. What do you think it needs to happen in order that we can, in order we can back clean rivers and forests or clean air? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So the first step is to, the first, in the context of the Cello protocol, the first step is to be able to account for pristine forests or clean rivers or clean air in some way. You know, one way to do that is through cre the creation of tokens. So I can imagine um, somebody buying a forest um, and an old growth forest and then creating tokens of that forest. These, each token represents one acre of the forest. And then what happens is those tokens can then be purchased by the reserve. The community would have to uh, create a governance proposal that says we want X percent, say 10% of the reserve to be in forest tokens. And then what happens is the reserve will start as, as people start bringing cello dollars into existence, the, the reserve will start purchasing forest tokens in order to, to back them. And those for, forest tokens would stay in the reserve so long as the protocol continues to grow. And so that becomes a way to back money with forest. Is, is the, the first step is to account for it. And one way to account for it is to tokenize it. Next up, we have, let's say I am building an application for the unbanked. What would be the best way to reach them? And how can the Cello Network help me with that? Yeah, you know, I think, uh, I mean, my general feeling on this is that um, the there are a lot of great people working in this space um, and the, um, and, Many of them are members of the Cello Alliance for Prosperity, and so, so from from my perspective, one of the best uh, the best ways to kind of um, start kind of getting one's feet wet in this space is to start kind of communicating with, being aware of, working with the NGOs who are working in this space. Um, and so, and so, so the, I, as a first step, I mean, kind of taking a look at the members of the Alliance for Prosperity is a really nice way to kind of start to get acquainted with the space. Next question is, I am drafting a concept of how we can use Celo for SME financing. Uh, can I join the camp? And is this of interest to Cello? Um, so I, w w uh, Rachel, maybe I'll let you speak to the camp piece. Um, uh, uh, but from my perspective, I'm very interested in uh, a small, medium businesses. I think small, like I think s s small businesses are. Uh, a bedrock of the economy, um, and they're an amazing. Uh, the entrepreneurship, basically, kind of. Uh, how do I put this? The the one's own growth in in starting and stewarding a small business is an amazing uh, uh, growth practice for the people doing that. 
so for those two reasons, I'm particularly very interested in, in small and medium businesses and how to support small and medium businesses. Um, interestingly, my co-founders, Renee and Merrick, their uh, first company was a company called Loku, which the whole mission of Loku was to support small and medium businesses. And in terms of the camp, you can, you know, we're open to all stages of projects. So, uh, yeah, please feel free to apply and we look forward to receiving your application. Um, okay, so we have another one voted in for does Cello, will Cello have another stable coin like CUSD, CEUR, CIDR? And when you make this project, do you facilitate people to easily move from old financial? Um, yeah, it's a it's a great question. So uh, this um, the the question of um, I, I mean I, both of those questions actually have a similar answer, which is that it's up to the community and in two different ways. In the first way, I mean new stable coins will need to be, uh, be proposed through governance, and it's the community who both proposes and votes on governance. Um, and then um, kind of having it easy to, um, to, to move from old financial services to crypto backed financial services, that is also, um, I know that there's a number of developers who are working on that, but the way that will come into being is through the development community, um, the developer community. Our next voted in question is, does Cello, oh, just got moved to the top. Does Cello have specific targets to reach in this year or in the next coming five years? Yeah. Um, you know, my, uh, our intention as a protocol is um, to, uh, there's a lovely, um, uh, I, I want to give two examples, like meta, metaphysical examples, and then um, and then dive into the answer to that. But the two examples will frame that, um, which is, uh, you know, uh, some of the artists that I admire the most uh, basically tell a story, but they actually tell half the story and they let the viewer fill in the rest. Um, and some of them take it even to a next level, like Saul LeWitt, when you buy a Saul LeWitt drawing, um, it comes with, um, it, it's just, you don't buy a drawing, you buy kind of something that says, draw a circle and then move to the right and then draw a bunch of lines and so on. And, um, and so, and, Jay Z has a really lovely line in one of his one of his songs where he says, "I tell you half the story, the rest you fill it in." And so, so my hope is that from the from the cello perspective, the story architecture that we that we put into place gets to the point of telling a telling half the story, telling kind of a story of um, of how different features of money can can lead to uh, a, a, a stronger and more widespread prosperity, you know? Um, but then it's important also for us to let the developer community fill in half the story to kind of talk about, well, what does this look like in my community? What does this look like in terms of what I'm passionate about over the next few years. Um, and so for that reason, we tend to be light on long range, on, on centrally determined long range targets. Uh, we, we tend to rather kind of instead build, try to build a, a, an open story architecture and a supporting software architecture that'll allow for the developer community to be setting targets um, and, then, and, then, and then executing on those targets. 
And then we have time for just one more question. Does the Silo protocol or Valora wallet, will it have an inherent UBI feature or do you expect it to build on top of Celo? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Of all of those, of all of the five features, um, the basic income slash basic dividend is one of the most difficult um, and one of the most uh, one of the most kind of uh, one of the areas that we still have the most work to do. Uh, I mean, right now, the way that we think about it is the way that we've been thinking about it is in two ways. The first is that we wanted to um, uh, allow for um, anybody with a mobile phone to be able to earn Cello. And so that we do through the validator, uh, uh, through the mobile phone verification uh, piece of the protocol. Um, the second is we wanted to create the ability for people to build community currencies on top of, of Celo and to have any means, whatever means they choose, whatever monetary policy they choose for the community currency. One thing that I think could be really, I, I think will be really interesting is this combination, a uh, monetary policy that has a, a that has a combination of three things. One is it's a local currency. The second is it has a basic dividend within the community that it's a local currency. And then the third is it has demurrage. That combination of local currency, demurrage, and, 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 and basic income, I think could be really powerful. So that's, those, are the, those are the ways that we think about um, uh, basic income, basic dividend in the context of SOM. Seth, thank you so much for your talk today. It was uh, really inspiring and very informative. And um, I know that I really enjoyed it. So thank you so much for joining us today. And to all our attendees, um, our event series continues next week on Wednesday, September 30th with uh, our investors fire side AMA on fundraising. And on October 7th, you can learn more about the Cello platform in our technical overview with Mari, who is the co-founder of Cello. You can find these links to our events on our website, cellocamp.com. And we also look forward to receiving your applications. Again, the deadline is October 5th. And um, yeah, we're really excited to see you. Join us next week. And Seth, thanks again. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you all for for taking this hour with me. It was a it was a pleasure to to chat and answer any questions that you guys had. All right. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Well.